So please, Ying, uh, I'm really grateful. It's wonderful. Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, Andrew, for inviting me. So honored to be invited to give uh, this lecture on, on socialism. All right, so let me share my slides with you guys. Uh, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, China, socialism and after. Here is a, a brief outline of the structure of uh, this presentation. I'm going to uh, first talk about the socialist period, which is from 1949 to 1978, and then to talk about the economic reform period, which is the 19, uh, starting from 1978 to present. I'm going to talk about why I think this kind of uh, demarcation makes sense and is more relevant to the current uh, Chinese model. Um, but uh, the first thing I want to talk about is what does really, uh, what does socialism really mean, or how do I really use this term in today's uh, lecture? So I'm aware of the controversy regarding the term socialism itself. Uh, many would argue that socialism never really existed, not in United, not in Soviet Union, or not in uh, China either, because, for example, they never uh, managed to abolish wage labor system, or it never really achieved workers' own control of production and distribution, or that inequality still exists uh, between workers and the party state elites. Basically, uh, there are a lot of people arguing that the actually existed socialist project in the 20th century didn't really quite fit the idealistic uh, picture. Uh, that was envisioned by early socialist theorists. So in this talk, I'm gonna avoid those controversy by using a term socialist economic system uh, in which I mean uh, the economic production mechanism of socialist nature. Uh, so this would be an economic system that has two uh, fundamental features one is that it's, uh, it's, uh, it has economic planning as its dominant coordination mechanism. And the other is that it has social ownership of means of production. So for those of you who are familiar with the literature, you would, you would know that this is the more kind of traditional uh, definition, let's say definition or understanding of socialism uh, from, you know, from maybe Marx or Engels. And Engels in particular in his article, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, made this argument that uh, socialism should not be an eclectic combination or as he termed the mishmash of all the previous ideas about and all the imaginations of socialism uh, that has occurred in history. Instead, it should be a, the direct negation of the observed contradictions of capitalism. And in Marx and Engels time, the contradictions that they, they observed were two things. One is the private ownership of means of production, and second is the anarchy of production. So to negate the anarchy of production, socialism should have economic planning or coordination among different sectors. And to negate the private ownership of, the, of means of production, socialism needs to have social ownership of means of production in its fundamental base. So that's why uh, here I am going to just use socialist economic system to refer to a system that has those two features uh, in, this, in the economy. Um, why is it important to learn, right? So uh, I have been asked to give lectures on China a lot of times, and most of the time people are more interested in learning about the economic reform period. Uh, but I always try to uh, include the history of socialist period as well in my talk, because I found uh, it's very important and very helpful for us to actually understand the economic reform policy that was taken in uh, starting from 1978. Basically, the history of socialist period set the foundation for the cause of economic reform time. Um, also, I think it's important to learn about the socialist past of history because uh, the socialist period in China had some achievements. 
And those achieve, achievements can serve as good model for the anti-imperialist struggles and also to address poverty issues that uh, is still um, present in the third world countries today. Another thing is that it, uh, like we all know, the socialist period in China had a lot of failures. And those failures for me would be important lessons uh, for, uh, for us to understand the future socialist movement and especially for socialist movement taking place in the more resource scarce and poor regions. And third thing I think is important uh, to learn and to focus on is this persistent struggles within the Communist Party in China between the pro-socialist faction and the pro-capitalist faction. So this is something that I feel is often dismissed in the interpretation of China's history. Usually people would consider the Communist Party as a uniform party. Every party member had exactly the same ideology. They wanted to do exactly the same thing, right? But if you really carefully study the history, uh, you would find that there is this kind of persistent struggle within and they were reflected, this kind of struggles were reflected in the actual policies implemented during the socialist time, as well as in the economic reform period um, as well. Uh, okay, so I'm going to first talk about the historical conditions for Chinese socialist revolution. Uh, China basically started to be invaded by Western imperialist powers since 1840s. After several failed attempts to battle against imperialists, Chinese officials and intellectuals painfully acknowledged that they had to learn Western science and philosophy to empower their own country if they want to end this kind of humiliation. They were facing different choices. One choice was to also launch a capitalist development path. There were a lot of debate about whether China should do that because at that time, the only country, the only Asian country, which was also a late industrializer that seemed to have successfully developed was Japan, right? So Japan took the in capitalist industrialization path uh, starting from the Meiji re restoration and later became a very strong imperialist power itself, uh, of which China is its victim, right? So there was this group of politicians and intellectuals who proposed that, well, maybe we should follow the Western modernization path, just as Japan did, um, with private capitalists dominating the industrialization process, on top of which we can build a parliamentary democracy. Such demand was reflected by the slogan of democracy and the science in the 1919 student movement under the Republic of China. However, just as uh, the political economist Paul Baron later theorized, the capitalist class in the backward country were usually too weak to lead a thorough capitalist revolution. And the countries will instead assume a combination of the worst features from feudalism and capitalism. Same thing happened in China. On the other hand, there was uh, this emerging disillusionment uh, with Western liberalism as a result of the sufferings under colonization. Um, and the then ruling party, the Nationalist Party, uh, was collaborating uh, with imperialist powers, or at least makes a lot of concessions within the imperialist powers. So there was a lot of, there were a lot of intellectuals and activists uh, who started to uh, look for a different school of thought. A school of thought that also came from the West because they already realized that the Chinese philosophy is too uh, left behind. It was not able, they were not able to apply it again to, uh, to strengthen their own power. So they have to learn from the West, right? But then uh, they want to look for a Western school of thought that is also at the same time critical of capitalism and imperialism. And then they found Marxism. Marxism fits the criteria perfectly. Um, then uh, 
after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, which occurred in 1917, uh, the Chinese Communist Party was also founded only four years later in 1921. So you can see a lot of intellectual that time, even if they were drawn to the idea of Marxism, they never see it realized in, in, in reality. So they also didn't really form a party. It was really inspired by the Soviet revolution that they started to think of it as a viable path. Um, you know, something that is different from the Japanese past, right? It's different from a capitalist past, that they can do something different. That they also founded a communist party within China in 1921. Um, they also at that time, because they were so weak, they formed a united front with the ruling regime at that time, uh, the Nationalist Party, or as some of you are familiar with the term, the KMT uh, party. Uh, so to, they kind of form a coalition between the uh, Communist Party and Nationalist Party to fight against the Japanese imperialists at that time. But then this union collapsed when the Nationalist Party or the KMT launched a political purge, killing thousands of communists. So that time they're killing thousands of communists. It's not just a regular communist member, right? Because that time communist uh, party is also very small. So the thousands of communists they killed really are the crucial kind of members, uh, officials uh, within the party themselves. So that really uh, uh, made a lot of communist members uh, disillusioned again to have this possible collaboration with the nationalist government. Um, so they, basically this incident, this massacre started the long battles between the KMT and the CC, CCP. So for someone who are interested in the history of, you know, uh, of, the, uh, of the separation between mainland China and Taiwan, uh, I recommend you to read uh, one article written by um, Meissner, Morris Meissner, on the entire history. Uh, and this kind of uh, battle between the KMT and the CCP was really played a crucial role in that sense. Um, so they had, a long, they had a long battle and CCP gradually grew strong and eventually took power in 1949. Um, so this was uh, basically the historical context of the socialist revolution in China. After they took power, they started to build socialist economy. Uh, an Indian economist called uh, Ashok Mitra, who wrote a book about uh, terms of trade, uh, made this argument that the polemics of revolution had to be substituted by the artifices of economic growth. Basically what he meant was that all the promises that were made about socialism need to be backed by reality, in particularly the improvement of living standards. So you cannot just say to people that, oh, socialism is good, it's ideal, we should all have socialism because it's egalitarian, this and that, but at the other, on the other hand, have people still suffering from poverty, right? So that's why for uh, China and Soviet Union and lots of 20th century social, socialist projects, the very first thing they did was to rapidly industrialize the economy and to catch up with the West, basically, in terms of the living standard. So same thing, that uh, China also did, uh, did that, uh, also was trying to do that, let's say, uh, by transforming the economy into a socialist one, which just means that to socialize the means of production, socialize the ownership of means of production. Um, contrary to what most uh, observers, naive observers would like to believe, both nationalization of the industry and also the agricultural collectivization actually took a long time to complete. Uh, so the Communist Party took power 40, in 1949, right? It almost took them seven to eight years to complete agricultural collectivization and the nationalization of industries in the urban sector. So it was actually a gradual process. Um, in the agricultural sector particularly, it was uh, a gradual uh, building, uh, a gradual step-by-step -step pro uh, process by first of all, 
uh, encouraging the forming of mutual aid team, which basically is just a household, several six or seven households voluntarily work with each other and voluntarily pulling their labor together for their farm work. And the second stage is to launch lower level, uh, lower level co-ops. So lower level co-ops means that now uh, households are farming on the pooled land. They each contribute their land to the collective, to the co-op, right? Uh, but uh, uh, after, the, uh, after the harvest, each household is going to be distributed based on the land input as well as their labor input. That's the second stage. The third stage is a gradual consolidation of all the lower level uh, and the mutual aid team into advanced co-op. Advanced co-op means that uh, they have collective ownership of land and tools, but then distribution is still based on labor input, right? So uh, basically by the end of 1956, uh, uh, this kind of consolidation into advanced co-ops uh, have uh, has completed, has been completed. So we can, we can consider that agricultural collectivization was completed. And after that, uh, the first commune was established in 1958. So a lot of people hear about communes, right? Hear about some tragedies happening in the commune, hear about some disasters happened there. But actually commune uh, itself is not the end of com uh, collectivization. The, advanced co-op itself is the uh, is the actually the goal of uh, agricultural collectivization. The difference between commune and advanced uh, co-op was that advanced co-op is only production unit. They only took care, take care of production. But commune is a community. Commune also has to perform a community service meaning that they need to provide entertainment uh, infrastructure, entertainment uh, equipment. They need to provide schooling for the children there, right? They also need to provide uh, house clinics for the residents there. The barefoot doctor, for example, that, were, that that system was established during the Cultural Revolution was affiliated with commune. So basically people who can just go to their own community to see doctors. So that was really uh, what commune was about. It has its own social function. It's not just a production unit. Economic planning. Uh, the planning uh, mechanism was also uh, established. Uh, the state council was responsible for making economic plans every five years. Uh, the first five-year plan covered the period 1953 to 1957. So uh, if one actually reads those economic planning, uh, you would find that they are actually not so different from bis business strategic plans. So they talked about, first of all, how the, uh, what, what the current economy is at, what should be the development goal in five years, and what are the strategies and the related budget allocation to achieve that goal. So for example, uh, the first five-year plan in China said, stated that the focus should be the development of the 156 industry enterprises that were established with the support of the Soviet Union experts. But then it was revised. It was revised because then Korean War happened. So they revised it along the way when they, seems that, when they see that the production target is no longer achievable. They would revise it along the way. So it's not as people would often think that it's just a very dogmatic mandate on the economy. Somebody sitting in the office, think of some production goal and everyone has to follow it, right? So it's actually not like that. So the whole mechanism is that according to the national plan, every province makes their own plan for industrial enterprises, but also coordinate among those sectors according to their industrial linkages. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, say how many steels will be needed to achieve certain production target of bicycles, right? So if the central government made some uh, production target, the central government, first of all, never make that specific target of product producing how many bicycles. Usually they would say, okay, we need some consumer goods. We need some light industry goods, or we need how many, uh, you know, uh, heavy industry goods, right? But the local province government, local government would make more specific targets 
say if if say if the local government say we need you know how many millions of bicycles uh, and they gave this order to a certain enterprise then they would also have to make sure that uh, uh, they can supply the inputs to that very enterprise to produce that many bicycles if there are not so many inputs, right? If they cannot really coordinate and find another enterprise to supply those inputs to the bicycle factory, then the bicycle factory could say that, okay, either we, you give me more inputs or you know, we have to revise the target. I cannot produce that much, right? So this is really the planning mechanism. Um, so a lot of people would criticize that the planning mechanism is just top down. Uh, but actually, the local province and enterprises have some inputs in forming the plan. And this is especially so after the tragedies uh, occurred during the Great Leap Forward. There were more kind of strict uh, uh, kind of conversation, negotiation between enterprises and government, uh, local government and central government in terms of setting more realistic targets. contradictions within socialist economy. So like every economic system, socialist economy in China also had many contradictions um, as a result of external and internal conditions. Not only China, all the 20th century socialist projects face these challenges from a capitalist world system, which compels them to launch rapid industrialization to catch up with the living standards of the advanced capitalist countries. And in this regard, uh, in terms of catching up with the West, I would say that the USSR did a much better job than China. I think largely because China just started with even less favorable economic conditions than USSR. Um, Russia that at that time already developed some industrial capacity before the revolution, but China is predominantly agrarian. Um, so in that sense, the starting position is less favorable. So uh, China, basically follow the socialist path for maybe 30 years. And even um, after that 30 years, China was still much lag behind Soviet Union in terms of the uh, average living standard. Um, also, the 20th century socialist countries do not have their own colonies to exploit, right? Uh, this is very different from early capitalist industrializers. So what it means uh, practically is that their socialist industrialization had to be supported by internal accumulation. What does it, internal accumulation mean? It means that you, for China, for example, it's predominantly agrarian economy, then you have to extract surplus from the agriculture sector because that's the only productive sector in the economy, right? And at the same time, they also have to suppress uh, domestic uh, consumption in the urban sector. And this uh, also for the sake of saving more capital for investment, right? So a lot of scholars later criticized China's socialist time, uh, particularly with, with, with respect to the suppressed consumption part. You know, so the urban workers, although they are guaranteed job tenure, lifetime job tenure, or they're guaranteed basic social services, but they are still poor. They are still considered poor. They don't really have access to a lot of consumer goods and the sophisticated consumer goods. I mean, that's also, they are all valid critique, I think, right? But I think for us, it's important to realize that, uh, you know, China was developing that time uh, without having its own colonies to exploit. So if they want to support, invest and support industrialization, it has to come from internal uh, money. It has to come from internal uh, accumulation, either the peasants, peasants or the workers, right? Um, and then the second thing, monopoly of knowledge and skills. Industrialization relied heavily on knowledge, technical and managerial skills that were monopolized by the elite class, many of which came pre uh, actually came from previously landlord or a capitalist class. Those are the class that were quite hostile to the to Communist Party for sure, also hostile to the whole overall socialist ideology. Most workers and peasants are more politically inclined towards socialist ideology, uh, but they do not possess the expertise for effective leadership. So this was really the classic red and experts conundrum that we see 
um, in China. I think in other countries as well, um, in Soviet Union as well, actually, but they didn't explicitly address the question. In China, uh, they, the state actually tried to address the question, but failed. Um, so it always got backfired from experts whenever the pro-socialist faction within the, uh, within the Communist Party attempted to democratize the industrial management by breaking down the power monopolized by the managers. Um, so I, I will talk more about this, what are the attempts later. Uh, but basically this uh, red and expert conundrum uh, uh, issue was prevalent throughout the socialist history in China. Um, And again, I think I mentioned briefly, there was this persistent struggles between the pro-socialist and pro-capitalist factions within the, within the party. Each time, uh, when, whenever the socialist faction gained some small victory, it, would, it was followed very quickly by a landslide victory of the pro-capitalist faction, usually in the name of economic stability. And Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution were two most eminent examples in this regard. So we can actually discuss this later. Uh, and I, I'm also going to talk a little bit in, in the, in the, in the uh, following slides. Uh, but this is something that uh, might need a lot of time to dig into. I cannot, um, I can't explain too many detail at this moment. But I welcome questions on that. Okay, next thing, achievements and failures. So achievements, well, there have uh, been undeniably many achievements during the socialist period. Most achievements were in terms of enhancing the development of productive forces, which mean you know, increasing labor productivity or technological progress or infrastructure constructions. Uh, here I have a table, uh, which is also uh, in the book that I, in the reading that I assigned to you, it's a Ming Chi Li's book. So you can actually see from this table that China's GDP growth rate uh, uh, and income per capita is pretty fast, even based on the most author authoritative historical statistics developed by Angus Madison project, right? So if you don't look at the official statistics and look at the Madison statistics, you will see that it's also pretty impressive. Uh, um, so the only the difference uh, between the two statistics is that Madison used this kind of price indices that kind of underestimated the contribution of the industri uh, industrial sector in China. But that's, uh, uh, that's another thing. Um, so what I want to highlight is that the socialist China did not experience the kind of growth without development that say scholars like Walter Rodney criticized as most African countries underwent during colonization. Workers were guaranteed lifetime job tenure um, or in, in Chinese term, we call it iron rice bowl uh, so it's unlike the capitalist countries where managers in China didn't, didn't really have the right to force workers to work harder with the threat of unemployment. So that created all this problem of incentive structure, right? How do we really incentivize workers to work harder without having this kind of disciplinary mechanism that are often used in capitalist economy? So that really is a big uh, question. Um, there was also significant, so in, instead, of, uh, in addition to GDP growth, which is a very, as we all know, it has a lot of problem, it has a lot of bias, right? It doesn't really tell us a, a, about the real development level, but China uh, actually also invested a lot heavily on both the public health sector and the education sector. Um, life expectancy wise, uh, uh, China was uh, uh, was able to make huge improvement. In uh, 1951, uh, the life expectancy was only 32. By the end of the socialist period, it already doubled, it became 66. So this progress was quite impressive if we say compare it to the Indian case, which is also a populous country, which gained its independence around the same time as China, right? 
but instead took a capitalist development path. So in India, uh, its life expectancy achieved only 54 by the end of 1980. So you can actually see very clearly uh, what the investment priority is in both countries, even if they are probably, they probably have similar level of you know, economic growth, so overall uh, output per capita. So I have a table here. I mean, I'm gonna send this uh, slides for you if you're interested, but this is again a, a, a table that you will see in uh, the reading that I assigned to you. Um, you can see very clearly uh, here that uh, the most significant progress in terms of improving life expectancy actually occurred during the socialist period in China, not the reform period. Um, other than life expectancy, there is infant mortality uh, falling rapidly during the socialist period. There was also effective control of infectious uh, diseases. And in particular, there was this uh, system of barefoot doctors, which means providing basic healthcare, healthcare training to rural medical practitioners so that they can meet the basic needs of uh, rural populations without having to go to form a medical, for a formal medical school. So this model was uh, pr uh, promoted and recommended by many public health experts. So here I uh, put the citation, Blumenthal and Xiao, who I think is affiliated with Harvard Public Health School, and they actually are specialized in comparative medical system. Um, and they were, they in this paper, they talked about how the barefoot doctor system um, was, a, was actually uh, very effective in terms of meeting the basic needs of rural population. Education-wise, literacy rate also had a sharp increase. Uh, in 1951, it was less than 20%. By 1970, uh, all the uh, uh, people within the age group of uh, 25 to 29 are more or less educated, right? It's more than 90% of literacy rate. From the gender perspective, full employment was guaranteed for both men and women. Feminist literature, I think I, I cited here, right? Uh, this is one, just one article of it. I'm gonna talk more about gender in, in later slides, but feminist literature basically agree, agree that, consider that cultural revolution uh, is when feminist struggles reached its peak. So that was between 1966 to 1976 during the Cultural Revolution period. That was the time when women started to enter occupation that they were rarely exposed to uh, previously. And the struggle at that time was to further socialize childcare and other household reproduction activities, as well as equal to promote the equal share of household work between men and women within the family. Um, so we're gonna talk about how after the economic reform, all those progress uh, basically was uh, reversed. Uh, one example that I really like to cite uh, is that uh, the first and only Chinese female Nobel laureate is in the field of medicine. And she actually, dis uh, she discovered, so she, uh, her discovery uh, is for the treatment of, treatment of malaria. Uh, but you, you rarely, I mean, you, you probably have heard about her, right? But you rarely would hear about when did she really made that discovery. She actually made the discovery in 1972. That was between, that was during the Cultural Revolution. She and her team made that discovery. Uh, but even the Chinese media didn't talk about it because again, the Cultural Revolution was considered as really the dark age of, of, of the Chinese history. But it really tell a lot about the focus of uh, medical research at that time and how women were encouraged in participating in this kind of occupation. Um, so this is, I think, why it's important to view China's uh, post-reform economic miracle uh, within the context of all these achievements made during the socialist period. Um, as I said in the beginning, it set the foundation of the course of economic reform. Um, so as summarized by uh, ec economic historian Robert Allen um, in 2011, he said that uh, by the end of the planning period in China, 
uh, China already has a highly educated population, a large industrial sector, low mortality rate, uh, and a scientific establishment with significant R&D capabilities, right? So basically the miracle didn't come out of nowhere. It has a solid base that was set during the planning period, during the socialist period. So with this kind of labor force in hand from the perspective of the foreign capital, this is the most attractive thing for them, right? Although Chinese labor, uh, were not Chinese laborers were probably not the cheapest in the world, but it would be the co most cost effective uh, uh, country to invest uh, because it has this disciplined, healthy, educated laborers and as well as very mature infrastructure base. So that's why I think uh, without actually studying the uh, socialist period, you would just find it very strange that all of, you would re even jump into conclusion that, oh, it was just because of the opening up. It was only because of market economy reform that China started this kind of economic miracle, right? But actually the reality is more complicated than that. Okay. Uh, attempts and failures. Um, during the short 30 years of socialist development, China has made several attempts to not only defy the capitalist development path, but also deviate from the Soviet model. Uh, it launched agricultural industrialization under the walking on two legs campaign in the late 50s, uh, instead of following the more traditional urban focused development model. The building of industrial base in the rural sector, although initially led to shortage of farm hands, which partially uh, contributed to the famine during the Great Leap Forward in the late 50s, later actually became the foundation of the township and village enterprises uh, that played crucial role in the economic growth uh, of, uh, in the, during the initial stage of economic reform. In the industrial sector, China had made several attempts to deviate from the Soviet model, but particularly the Soviet one-man management model since the late 50s, uh, meaning that the managers make decisions and the workers simply follow orders, right? The most important uh, and most famous uh, Chinese industrial ma management model was innovated by a steel factory uh, that uh, required managers to participate workshop labor workers to participate in management in order to break down this hierarchical structure in the industrial enterprises. Um, and also to make sure that workers' participation in management did not just stay on paper, the state established spare time schools for workers so that they could quickly acquire the knowledge and the skills to fully participate in management roles. However, unfortunately, the red and expert problem occurred, right? Uh, the managerian class responded by direct sabotage. So this is very similar to capital strike in the capitalist countries, uh, that they, you know, sometimes just uh, uh, deliberately, uh, you know, uh, encourage workers probably to make wrong decisions or to uh, wrongly estimate production target, right? So that in the end, there, it created a lot of economic disruptions. Um, so each time after this kind of brief economic chaos, the conservative faction within the party later became the pro-capitalist faction, will we'll again uh, gain the dominance and the radical struggles would be diluted in the name of economic stability. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a little bit because time-wise it seems like we, uh, I need to fast up, I need to pace up a little. So, okay, uh, another example is to, uh, is, uh, to launch the class-based affirmative action in the higher education institutions in China. This was also to deviate from the Soviet model because China was very critical of the elitist education model uh, implemented in Soviet Union. So they actually gave quotas to workers and peasants uh, in higher education, but it was backfired. It was, you know, it was 
complained by a lot of the students from intellectual or formerly you know, landlord classes because they are also qualified students, of course, but they were deprived of the right to enter college just because of this affirmative action policies. So there's, there are a lot of uh, you know, uh, com uh, complaints and grudges holding by, the, uh, by, by, by people from the more elitist background uh, in China because of this kind of more pro-worker, uh, pro-peasant so, uh, pro policies. Um, and this was basically inevitable in a very poor country, in a resource scarce country where you don't even have many colleges, right? In the first place. Okay. So one might ask, why did China take the trouble to launch so many experiments instead of just simply focusing on economic development? So a short answer to that question would be that uh, China was really trying to build real socialism, not just socialist economy. So it has made efforts not only in developing productive forces, but also in advancing social relations of production, meaning all the property relations and the power and the control relations uh, uh, governing society's productive assets. In his book, The Rise of China and the Demise of the Capitalist World Economy, uh, that I also assigned the reading, uh, the polit political economist and also the former prisoner of the 1989 student movement, uh, Ming Chi Li, argued that socialist China faced several ch challenges. Uh, the uh, you know, the, there was challenge about the West. There was challenge about uh, addressing poverty issue, uh, and there was also this challenging about bringing a more fundamental transformation of political, economic, social relations in China, um, as well as in the world system as a whole, and to prepare the necessary conditions for a fundamentally different and much more egalitarian and democratic new world. And Li argued that China did uh, relatively well in terms of addressing poverty issue. And it did, uh, okay in terms of catching up with the West. Not so much success, but still okay. But this was really the challenge that China made a, as he said, made a heroic, made a heroic attempt, but failed. So China was trying to actually do something that's different from Soviet Union, but it failed as largely as a result of the historical context at that time. Okay, economic reform. Um, economic reform in China, in essence, uh, uh, was a gradual process of capitalist transformation. The nature of the transformation was capitalist because on the one hand, it aimed at, uh, at privatizing the ownership of means of production in the entire economy, initially in the agriculture sector and later in the state-owned industrial sector. On the other hand, the transformation allowed the market economy to gradually replace economic planning and to become the dominant coordination mechanism in the economy. Agricultural decollectization first uh, started in uh, 1978 as an experiment, but later uh, was imposed by the state on every single collective, right? So it became a national policy that every collective has to conform, uh, has to conform to, even if they are doing extremely well. Even for collective that already are mechanized, they have to separate. They have to split the land. They have to uh, basically split up, up the land and distribute it to each. Uh, household, right? So it, that created a lot of a waste of machinery uh, that were hard earned by the peasants at that time. William Hinton's book, uh, Great Reversal, recorded some detailed case studies in this regard. Um, there was initially a production and income boom in 1984. Uh, which was often used by mainstream scholars as the example for uh, further privatization of the economy. Uh, but later studies found that the production uh, boom in the agricultural sector was largely due to the combined effects of grain stocks from previous years, uh, previous uh, you know, collective uh, production, 
and also an overuse of fertilizers and pesticides, which contributed to the declining amount of arable land in the countryside. There was also an income boom uh, among the peasants initially, but it was largely a result of state's deliberate raise of procurement price to pacify the rural residents and to forestall any possible struggles against the collectivization policy. And such production miracle quickly busted. In 1985, uh, China had the grain crisis, grain output crisis. Uh, China had to import, actually, uh, grains from abroad. With the collapse of the communes, the commune level health clinics that I uh, think I mentioned before, uh, and also the schools were also dismantled. Small local schools and health clinics were consolidated into big ones and located near towns. The rationale behind it uh, was to use resources more efficiently, right? They consider it's too inefficient to have small schools in, uh, in all communes. They have to consolidate it to big schools. And this created a lot of problem in terms of uh, kids' access to education and uh, or patients access to healthcare services. And also very quickly, uh, you started to see class differentiations among the peasantry. Um, and because each household has their own individual characteristics, right? Some people, some family might have more family members. Some might have members that are physically stronger. Uh, so that very quickly you started to see families that are doing extremely well after the decollectivization, and they started to hire people as their own wage labor. So you started to see all these wage labor arrangement and class differentiation. Um, at the same time, more and more households started to find agricultural income alone, no longer able to support their subsistence. And these families, these uh, people became the first patch of rural surplus labor to migrate to cities, to find jobs and to start begging. So up to up till now, it's pretty clear that the state has developed, uh, has abandoned this development model of walking on two legs or the balanced development of industrial and agricultural sectors. Without collectives, rural residents were basically left on their own and they were viewed as simply the potential reserve army of laborers to compete with the urban workers. The agricultural sector was hence abandoned uh, from the development agenda. Industrial sector, once the privatization in the agricultural sector was complete, the state then turned to industrial sector for further reform. Initially in 1984, I'm gonna pace up a little bit in that 84, they established the manager responsibility system, which just means that no more workers participating in managerial decisions. Now managers are the ones who make decisions. Workers just need to follow because that was considered more efficient. 1968, 86, sorry. Uh, this iron rice bowl mechanism, basically a worker's lifetime job tenure was dismantled. They launched the labor contract system and now give, manager, give managers the right to fire workers if they consider the workers unsatisfactory. And then the big cities started to uh, attract rural migrant workers to come to the urban sector and to compete with urban workers. Here I quote uh, a study from Solinger and Chen, uh, basically for the urban managers, the choice facing private employ employers was straightforward. They either would hire rural labor instead or play on the workers' eagerness to find new jobs, refusing to give them wages equal to regular workers, though they did just the same work, right? Basically now the rural surplus labor were used as a disciplinary mechanism to threaten the urban workers to work harder or to actually bargain, um, you know, to, to, to receive less pay. Uh, the working, working class power basically uh, was completely um, um, uh, threatened in a way. Okay, uh, three more slides. 
crisis and further privatization. So very quickly after the economic reform, if we remember the economic reform in the countryside started in 1979 and uh, the reform in the urban sector started in the 18, uh, 1984 actually, right? But very quickly we started to see a lot of the crisis tendencies. 1985 had the uh, green crisis, a grain crisis. Um, and then uh, uh, in, in the urban sector, the state launched the so-called dual track price system, which just means partial price liberalization. So it basically allow enterprises to mark their own price for their commodities that exceeded the production target. So for, uh, for the, for the uh, products that are within the production target that has to be submitted to the state, the price is still planning price. It's relatively low. But for those product, products that goes beyond the production tops, they can sell it on the market and it's usually a pretty high price. What happened was that those with networks, often government officials began to arbitrage between the low price and the high market price to make profits and it created a lot of corruptive activities and uh, really, um, uh, angered a lot of working class people. In 1980s, inflation started as a result of price liberation. Uh, and 1988, there was, there was bank runs. Um, the inflation crisis further aggra aggravated the working class and the students towards many government officials taking advantage of the dual track price system. Protests started as early as 1985 culminated in the 1989 student movement, often known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre. So at this point, it is really clear that the CCP has determined to continue the capitalist transformation, regardless of its costs imposed on ordinary citizens. So Hinton in his book actually uh, made, uh, had this statement uh, that he was talking about how Mao uh, Mao, uh, Mao Zedong, the, uh, the first uh, in the revolutionary leader in the Communist Party, already predicted this to come. So he said, Hinton said that Mao was far more astute. More than 20 years ago during the Cultural Revolution, he already exposed Deng and, and most of their hardline colleagues as capitalist roaders. He accurately predicted that if such persons ever came to power, they would transform the Communist Party into a revisionist party and finally into a fascist party. And then the whole of China would change color. The surprising thing, Hinton said, the surprising thing is not how accurate Mao's prediction turned out to be, but rather how quickly it materialized in history, right? It was really just um, 10 years after the economic reform that you started to see this kind of, um, uh, tragedy happening. 19, early, in the early 1990s, um, so basically after the Tiananmen movement, uh, it really signals the victory of the pro-market faction, pro-capitalist faction within the ruling party. And it also marked this era of depoliticizing the working class. So in 1990s, they started to uh, privatize state-owned enterprises and launch massive scale of layoffs. Such privatization actually is still ongoing today. I did a uh, field work two years ago and was um, able to talk to some uh, workers who, you know, who, who, who worked in those state-owned enterprises. Uh, the privatization uh, to the enterprises that I visited uh, came pretty late because they were processing uh, their responsibility was to process raw materials that were used for military uh, goods, military uh, industry. So they were used to be considered as crucial sector. But again, it was their turn eventually. Um, so uh, as described by them, it was really a long and painful process, this privatization process. Every month, they would hear, you know, another machine was sold, another workshop closed, another laid off worker committed suicide. And basically the workers had no say uh, in this kind of decision um, at all. With the privatization of state-owned enterprises, workers no longer had access to 
free or subsidized social services used to be provided through enterprises. Housing and healthcare now were all commodified. In 2001, China joined WTO and officially participating the global capitalist division of labor. It started serving as the reserve army pool for the global capitalism and it became a stabilizer also for the neoliberal world order. Okay, unsustainable miracle. So uh, this is really the stage that I, I guess you're more uh, familiar with, the economic miracle stage that was praised by many mainstream scholars. Uh, but I would argue that such economic miracle is already qualitatively different from that in the socialist period. Um, so first there was inequality, right? But even the inequality is now qualitatively different. During the socialist time, there was also in inequality. Of course, there were also income inequality. There was uh, this so-called age grade wage, wage system, depending on job skills and depending on the occupation. Um, so the top, say the top, uh, top wage level would be about three times uh, than the you know uh, than that of the lowest you know first grade wage level. So that was the income inequality. Also, it also exists, but they are all labor income in some uh, in some way, right? There was there was no capital income in the sense that you are basically generating income based on your ownership of capital, your ownership of uh, means of production. So that was a very different kind of inequality. Inequality today. There was surge in inequality, but also the difference is mostly from uh, is is mostly uh, from the difference between labor income and the capital income, meaning those who earn earn money from capital and land rent. So for those people, for most Chinese ordinary citizens who didn't really became capitalist, right? They uh, the economic miracle meant for them the reemergence of the new three mountains. The term uh, was previously used to depict the hard lives prior to the 1949 socialist revolution. And in socialism, these social services, housing, healthcare, and education were freely, either freely provided or heavily subsidized. So it was considered that the socialism has removed the three mountains, right, uh, for, the, for the ordinary people. But now the inhibitive costs are all imposed on ordinary people again. Um, the economic miracle also significantly rely on the heavy exploitation of rural migrant workers who were denied access to social welfare in the towns and cities that they work. Uh, instead, their land entitlement as a result of agricultural decollectivization now served as a buffer for them for the proletarianization of the rural migrant workers. So even though their major labor income now came from non-agricultural production, their reproduction still took place in the land they owned in the countryside. Um, especially childcare. Childcare is now uh, mostly performed by elderly or physically weak uh, in the rural sector. And chi the children uh, normally would only be able to see their parents once a year during the Chinese New Year because their parents cannot afford not finding jobs in the cities or even to bring them with them, uh, to bring the kids with them to the cities. Um, and this has created this issue of left behind uh, children uh, that a lot of the uh, development economists are paying close attention to. Gender, um, all the, sorry, basically all those transformation in the economic system has had some deep social implications. Um, I would like to highlight just one example, which is uh, from the gender perspective. So during the socialist period, both men and women, first of all, have job guarantee. And there were also on-site childcare services. Uh, and for some big enterprises, even enterprise affiliated schools. So it's very convenient for parents to send kids to those uh, infrastructures and parents were mostly liberated from childcare responsibilities. 
I was actually surprised to learn that during the 70s, I was talking to someone whose parents worked in a university in Beijing. And he told me that actually during that, during the 70s, uh, the, the, the university that his parents worked in have, has radically socialized childcare work to the point that parents only need to pick up their kids every week. So you can choose to still pick your kids every day, but you also have the option to, to pick up your kids every week, right? Think about that. Um, so it was, of course, an uh, extreme case. Most factories didn't really have that many resources uh, to provide that kind of level of uh, childcare. Normally, childcare is still provided during the normal work hour. But during the privatization of the urban enterprises, such on-site childcare services were dismantled as unproductive. Layoffs also disproportionately affected women. Um, when in some enterprises, each household was told to decide who should quit. So basically give you a quota, right? So uh, we know that it's gonna be hard on you. We're gonna fire you, but uh, you can choose. One person can keep the job, one person go home, right? Uh, so mostly in this case, women left their jobs. And this again became necessary in some sense because now on child on site childcare service was no longer available no longer available. So it, it became actually necessary to have at least one person to take care, care of the child at home. Uh, during my field work, uh, some female uh, you know, elderly told me that during the privatization, uh, the managers basically said to them, you know, uh, female co comrades, now you should all go back to take care of your children as a justification for layoffs. And for them, this was really insulting. Um, and it was uh, completely a, a reversal of all the progress that has been made uh, during the uh, socialist era. Okay. Uh, agriculture, okay. Agriculture sector. Um, the household uh, responsibility system meant that each household now had to rely on their own family member for agriculture work. This meant, that the wor this meant the worship of physical strength had contributed to the reinforcement of some preference. So now the family would prefer to have more voice, right? Because they were considered to be stronger and they can perform manual labor better. Before you have collective, if, even if your own family has shortage of labor, it's okay. But now you have to rely on your own. Therefore, there was this uh, observed reinforcement of some preference. And then after one child policy was implemented, which was implemented in 1979, by the way, it was after the economic reform that it was implemented because the state now has uh, subjected to the Marthusian reasoning that poverty was a result of large population, population not really about you know, social relations production. So they started to think that having less people would solve the uh, poverty issue. So when, in, when one child policy was implemented, some preferences in the agricultural sector translated into social tragedies such as female infanticide and this notorious missing women issue that is very common in most third world countries. Um, also at the same time, adult women uh, who married out lost their land entitlement in their birth households and their land ownership now heavily relied upon uh, the stability of their marriage. So this led to many women to actually lose their de facto choice to walk out of a marriage and intensifying domestic violence in the agriculture sector. So basically from the gender perspective, you can see that the feminist struggles experienced a complete reversal of the trend, uh, uh, reversal of trend following the reform. Previously, the struggles in the productive sectors have almost completed. The focus was shifted to household sector and struggles aim to further socialize uh, and other household activities. 
after the economic reform, all the progress made in the productive sector were wiped out. And let alone the little success in the household sector. So basically, the family struggle in China regressed back to day one. Um, so we're finally at the point to discuss the nature of China's economic system. Um, officially, the ruling party still called itself CCP, and the theoretical justification of all the uh, non-socialist element, let's call it, uh, was that. China was still at the preliminary stage of socialism, which just meant that it has a long way to go before it can achieve real socialism. So whatever we do now, it doesn't look like socialism we know, but you know, it's because it, we are still preliminary. Uh, we have to take a long way again to achieve the real socialism. There are also many uh, scholars debate about whether China can be considered as uh, a neoliberal state. So this might be something that um, you know, many of you are interested in as well. So I think, I personally think that the controversy is mainly the result of the choice of reference points. So if we use socialist period as the, so, as the reference point, then the fact that today 80% of the labor force uh, are working in the private sector and the fact that there is more precarity even within the state-owned enterprises, even within the public sectors. And also the fact that there is still ongoing privatization of the remaining publicly owned assets. We're all clear signals that China is going, undergoing a consistent neoliberal reform. But if we view it from a mature capitalist economy's perspective, then of course you can always find there are more things China can liberalize and privatize, right? And therefore a lot of people would say that China is a mixed model. So I think it's uh, important to see what the reference point is when we see scholars making argument about what the nature, uh, the nature of the Chinese economic system. Um, for me, uh, the dismantling of planning and social ownership of means of production in most productive sectors has undoubtedly established uh, a capitalist economic base in China. I would say also on top of which an authoritarian political regime. So in that sense, I think it resembled South Korea military regime in the 60s and 70s, which by the way is also the time period where South Korea experienced fastest economic growth. Or we, or we can also say it's quite similar to the Chile um, you know, uh, case after the neoliberal reform where the economic base is capitalist, but the political superstructure is more um, authoritarian. Okay, last slide. Uh, crisis tendencies. So since China's economic base is largely capitalist, it uh, hence became susceptible to all types of crisis capitalism inherently generates. From the economic perspective, profit rate in China has fallen rapidly since 2007. To give you some idea, 2007, the profit rate was still 23%, which is considered really high. That's why China was able to attract so many foreign investment. But in 2016, it declined to 13.6. And what does it mean, 13.6, right? In the US hist uh, economic history, when profit rate plunged under 11%, recession occurs. Historically, there were only two periods where profit rate in the United States fell under, uh, you know, fell under 10%. Uh, one period was Great Depression and the other was briefly in the 1980s during the structural transformation. So you can see now China is already you know, 13%. It's pretty close to that threshold where economic crisis could happen. Socially, what happened in Europe during the 19th century is now taking place in China. Uh, the capitalist industrialization and urbanization that have brought about fundamental changes to China's social structure proletarianized working class has become the majority of the Chinese population. And a new generation of Chinese workers is demanding economic, social, and political rights. Um, you can, we can actually see Chinese workers' struggles have grown in size and in militancy, and we're able to actually win some concessions from the capitalists. At the same time, you also see 
radicalized intellectuals, college students, or worker activists, and veteran revolutionaries have joined uh, forces to form China's new left. However, with declining economic profits, declining profit rates, uh, capitalists no longer wish to make any concessions to workers. Since 2014, capital went on strikes by dislocating factories to inner regions, ending this short-lived golden age of labor activism in China. While nothing manifests uh, this contradiction of Chinese capitalism better than its environmental crisis, China is uh, the world's largest uh, greenhouse gas emitter. Uh, with its current energy structure, on average, one, percent, one percentage point increase in the growth rates leads to about one percentage uh, increase in carbon emission. And studies have shown that if China wants to maintain the profit rate of about 10%, it has to grow at least 5% every year, right? So this means that this kind of carbon emission will continue at a rapid rate. Um, okay, renewable energy limits, we can talk about this later because some, uh, you might ask that, well, China is the largest investor in renewable energy, right? Why did it not help, right? So this is something we can discuss uh, maybe later. Uh, uh, COVID-19, I mean, this is uh, a, a, actually a concrete uh, example we could uh, talk about. Uh, basically, I bring this case, uh, bring up this case uh, because it really is the result that this COVID-19 crisis is really the result of the persistent environmental destruction that has been ongoing for many decades in China. Um, according to uh, evolutionary biologist Rob Wallace, capitalist agriculture often comes with land grabbing and deforestation, which destroys local environment and releases virulent pathogen to livestock and people. And capitalist livestock uh, production will intensify human animal interactions for the pathogens to evolve uh, into infectious viruses. So we actually should expect to see pandemic and, and epidemic from this kind of disease, in this kind of zoonotic disease more regularly. And we should expect to see them occur regularly in countries uh, hosting those kind of industries. Uh, and those industries, we should know that they were there to take advantage of the loose regulation in the first places. Um, Although China seemed to have managed the current uh, virus crisis, we should also not forget that all the effective measures that proved to be effective were against the logic of market. So this is something I really want to highlight. Uh, it was really a reversal of the neoliberal trend, neoliberal reform that has been ongoing for the past three decades. For example, in China, testing and treatment were free this time, right? It has already, I mean, the public health sector was already uh, privatized, uh, but this time for the COVID-19, testing and treatment were free. Public hospitals uh, actually send volunteers from all the uh, uh, provinces across the country to support Wuhan. There were 40,000 medical professionals from all the other provinces travel to Wuhan to support the local uh, hospitals. They were from public hospitals. Um, you might not believe that in, 19, uh, in, in 2019, only a, a year ago, nine, uh, 2019 June, the government issued an official document to impose a limit on the number and the size of public hospitals that any province can have. They were saying that, you know, we need to give private capital more room to invest in health sector because they're more innovative, they're more efficient. We don't, we don't need that many ho public hospitals anymore. In Wuhan, right, the, 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 the place where it was initially hard hit, only 27% of the hospitals were publicly owned. The national level is 37%. So during the crisis, the private hospitals decided to stay out of it. They didn't provide beddings, they didn't provide medical professionals, uh, it was mostly the public hospital uh, uh, doctors and nurses who, uh, you know, who, who, who supported uh, the, this kind of fight. 
Um, and this was the very reason uh, that the state had to mandate the constructions of two hospitals in 10 days. A lot of people are, you know, praising this miracle of, you know, fast construction in China, et cetera. But it, the problem, the very problem was lack of hospitals in the first place. And actually in Wuhan, there were only 98 public hospitals, but there were 258 private hospitals, right? So thinking that, let's think about it, well, building two more hospitals can now satisfy the demand, but there were actually 200 more private hospitals that were there and not helpful at all. And, and this kind of neoliberal transformation, this efficiency standard imposed on hospitals, this whole just-in-time criteria is not just happening in China, it's shared across the globe, right? The United States had the same problem, same issue. Um, uh, it really affected the capacity for, for all of this country to deal with the pandemic uh, this time. So I think I'm gonna stop here and um, um, we can maybe have a you know, discussion uh, after this. Thank you very much. Uh... Ying, it was a wonderful presentation, and uh, we should be all very proud of you to have you on our faculty. Uh, it was really uh, a great survey, and of course, with the reading together, I think we know more than we did before. So uh, my comments will be very short, uh, and of course, uh, some of what I say you probably will expect, but I will say it differently than, than anything I said to you in previous discussions. What I think is interesting here is that uh, someone whom I would say is from the Chinese New Left, you use this term yourself, and I think that term has been used for Minchi Li also by commentators on his work, uh, gives us a very different picture of, of the whole history really than what you would get from, uh, from established scholars, not on the right, I don't care what the right in the United States says, but scholars like uh, Norton, Brandt, Roski, uh, even Lardy, right? Uh, uh, that's the mainstream and you're presenting a different picture, a very different picture. And I think it's worth uh, uh, contrasting these pictures, although of course we don't have the time or the energy to really really do it. But let me just emphasize a few things. Uh, in their picture, uh, the socialist period turns out to be much more negative. By the way, they would not deny what you call the achievements. I don't think anybody, a serious scholar, would deny the achievements that you mentioned. But they would talk about other things. Uh, for example, uh, the very low level of consumption uh, what they would consider the primitive social uh, exploitation, primitive accumulation of the peasantry. Uh, they would stress uh, uh, also the human cost. I know from Lee's book that the Great Leap will be interpreted differently, this very great famine will be interpreted differently on different sides, but still uh, there were a lot of dead and it was very devastating. In China, of course, the Cultural Revolution will be interpreted differently too on both of these sides. So basically the difference is that their picture of, uh, of the socialist period is much more negative than yours. Uh, and, uh, and that's a significant, uh, that's a significant uh, difference. What is interesting for the next period, and this is not just a question of the fact that they're much more positive about the reform than you are, that they tend to have two periods of reform. That's a significant part of the literature. They speak about the reform between 78 and 92 as sort of first stage. It's the way Norton has it anyway, but I think it's general. And then after Tiananmen and the famous trip of Deng to the countryside in 92 comes another phase. So they really have two phases. And you tend to deal with the whole thing in a, in a single piece. And this raises, I think, parallel problems for both you and them. It raises the problem for them, but let's start with you, raises the problem for you, <laughs> is if the socialist period is understood in such a positive way, as a Marxist, can you really explain the shift on the basis of there being a capitalist faction all along in a party, which is pretty much the way you explain it. That's pretty voluntaristic and not really a Marxist explanation, right? Uh, of course, uh, uh, 
uh, you know, you need the objective and the subjective together, but still this objective must be there. Must be, there have to be something really wrong for the capitalist rotors. I think they're really Bukharanites. They're, in my reading, they are really right-wing socialists as against the left, as in Russia. But even if you call them capitalist rotors, they would need objective contradictions, tensions, potential crises to be able to do what they did. You know, people speak about a coup d'etat, a coup d'etat, but this is just a very narrow thing. Mao dies, and the Gang of Four is arrested, and the Deng faction comes to power. Okay, but for, for to be able to carry that out, there had to be something else available. People say, you may deny this, that there were crowds in the streets cheering when the Gang of Four is arrested. The Gang of Four is not popular, right? Okay, so the problem for you is, if the socialist spirit is so positive, why the next stage? How is it, how, how is that done? And the problem for the mainstream is analogous, because the mainstream uses the phrase for the first phase of reform, reform without victims, or reform without uh, uh, people who are deprived. Because as you know so well, much better than me, the first phase of reform does not yet produce unemployment on any large numbers. So in a way, uh, the level of state uh, uh, industry in the first phase is large enough to absorb uh, the unemployment uh, that ha happens in Russia, happens in Eastern Europe. In fact, this to me, the Chinese reform is much more attractive precisely because the way it was introduced in a more gradual and more careful way in the first phase. So if the first phase is so successful, this is the question to, to Lardy and to Norton and the others. You're not, they're not here today, okay, but it doesn't matter. You can use it at some point if you want. I give you full permission. If the first phase is so successful, it doesn't have any victims. Why go into the second phase after 92, which is radical, much more like the East European and Russian type transformation, radical privatization, dismantling, huge unemployment, uh, uh, getting a single price system, uh, which then of course on its own creates a lot of hardship for the poorest and so on. So that's, those are the two questions. And then finally, one more question, which is to Mr. Lee, who is not here, who looks like a very nice gentleman. I enjoyed his book very much. Uh, where would Mr. Lee go now? Now you didn't show yourself to be such a Wallersteinian in this presentation as he is. He's very Wallersteinian. And so I think on some level what he's really interested in is uh, the fact that the new China is gonna make the world system not work anymore. It's gonna create a f foundation for, for a new post-neoliberal phase everywhere. I think that's his thesis. Now, the question to him would be, you probably know him personally, the question to him would be, so well, how, do you, how do you visualize that new stage? Do you visualize it uh, on the basis of what China was in the socialist period, or what the European welfare states were in the 30 years after the Second World War? There's some clues in his book that what he's looking for is democratic socialism in a European way. Because he asked the question, what are you gonna do with this huge Chinese surplus? It has no place to go. So the only place it has to go, uh, uh, given uh, that the world is now run out of more China's and India's, is internal consumption. So the logic of, of the argument that Lee produces is that social democracy can be now renewed, maybe not in European countries, which no longer have the ability, uh, given Chinese and Indian competition, but China would be the next democratic socialist place because it has the surplus and it doesn't know what to do with it. And there are no more Chinas to invest it in. Okay, I stop. Those are the three, uh, four questions that I raised to you, to Norton and them and their friends and Lee, who is not the same as you necessarily. As I read, there's a conflict within the Chinese New Left about where to go. And that's why nastily I raised the question about that. Okay, I stop. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, so uh, these are all really important 
questions. Um, I'll try to address them um, as much as I can. There are a lot of questions that I myself am also trying to think through. So I really appreciate that you raise all these important questions. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, let, me, let me first address this question about the two stages of reform and the first stage being more benevolent and the second one more, uh, you know, um, brutal, let's put it that way. Why, if the first stage is successful, uh, does China still have to uh, launch onto the second stage of reform, which is massive privatization and the kind of reform that was more like uh, the, the, the Soviet Union uh, case, East European case. Um, so I think that uh, a, a useful way to understand is that the first stage of reform was in preparation for the second stage reform. And during the first stage, the, uh, the state was mainly trying to pacify workers and the peasants so that it can use that gradual process and offering some material rewards and bonus and to kind of, in a way to uh, prevent workers from any potential struggles uh, against the new state policies. But eventually it's going to launch onto the second stage because in the pro-capitalist faction, okay, later I'm gonna address this question about whether this kind of dichotomy makes sense at all, right? But I think in, uh, for, in the pro-capitalist faction, they always had this idea that uh, the incentive structure in the socialist economy was wrong because Mao and his uh, and some of the other pro-socialist uh, pro faction, which is really the minority in the party, um, always try to deal, uh, always try to get rid of the material intensive for incentive, for example. They are very critical about even the eight grade wage system. They think that it's, um, it's still it's still inequal, it's still unequal, right? Uh, they acknowledge its necessity at that particular time point because they know that we have to rely on people with knowledge and experts to manage the enterprises. And if you don't give them enough salary, enough wage, they probably won't be uh, you know, willing to perform that uh, role at all. Um, but the capitalist faction, pro-capitalist faction, always think that they need to bring in more material incentive. They need to give more bonus to managers. And they need to even have a, a higher gap between, you know, within that wage system. So actually, it is consistent. Their policy is consistent. And that is why right after the economic reform in 1979, they immediately raised the price of, of the procurement grains for the countryside people, right? Before the state procures grains and they pay, you know, um, on a kind of a relatively low prices, we would, we would say, right? Because they want to extract surplus from the agriculture sector. The reform immediately raised this price of procurement so that all the peasants feel like, oh, it's, you know, pretty, it's pretty good. This policy's reform is pretty good. So you know, in a way to, you know, pacify them. On the, in the urban sector as well, they didn't touch the workers for the first five years, right? Before 1979 to 1984. At that time, they introduced a lot of bonus system. They gave workers extra bonus. They give them a lot of raising their salaries, raising their wages. Also just to show that, you know, we're, we're, we're doing well, we're a benevolent government, we're a benevolent state. And, you know, once uh, the uh, rural sector is decollectivized, and the rural surplus labor was generated and were attracted to the urban sector to kind of compete uh, with the urban workers. Then this kind of coalition between workers and the peasants are completely broken. Before the state might be worried that, okay, you know, China has this history of revolution where the Communist Party won the revolution based on this coalition between workers and parties. How can we make sure that they don't have a backlash against us, right? So basically they use this divide and conquer strategy explicitly, try to first of all, break down the collectives in the agricultural sector and then break down the coalition between workers and, and peasants. And then they can launch, launch on this kind of more aggressive and more brutal 
kind of reform as Andrew, you were talking about, which a lot of people really suffered a lot. I mean, there are a lot of new rich for sure, but there are a lot of workers lay, laid off. There are cases, there are examples of, you know, hundreds of workers lining up on the railways trying to commit suicide together after they lost their jobs. There are also cases when, you know, the entire family lost their jobs and, uh, you know, the, the, the the, the wife had to start, uh, start work as prostitutes and the husband had to send the wives to, you know, to, to do prostitution work and then pick her back. So all those kind of tra social tragedies ha occurred, but those voices were silenced because the official ideology at that time was that, you know, these are all the necessary sacrifice. So I personally, the reason, I think it's a really great question. You're asking me why I put the two reform stage together. Uh, because for me, it is a consistent policy. Even if the constant, uh, even if the concrete policies themselves are different, the logic is, is similar. It's divided and conquer, it's privatization, it's bringing private ownership of means of production back to the economy. So that would be my answer to that question. Um, you also ask if socialism was so good, why didn't workers or peasants fight against the capitalism, right? I think that's also a very important question. Um, this is the, also the question that, um, um, you know, uh, that I ask myself and um, a lot of scholars are trying to understand if, uh, even uh, within the context of the Soviet Union, because we also see that, you know, not many workers trying to fight against Yeltsin, for example. Right? They actually are also supportive. The Yeltsin even won the, nom even won the election to be the president of, the, of, of, of Russia. So I think my understanding is that there are a lot of problems within socialism. There are a lot of failures in socialism, right? This is something that I also emphasize. So I didn't just talk about the achievement. I also talk about the problem with it, right? And one of the key thing is the hierarchical structures within it. So even if there's no, uh, not, not so great, say, income inequalities, or like I said, there's not a difference between labor income and capital income, uh, but there are still power imbalance. There are people who are securing the most crucial uh, positions in the society, that they have all the information, they, can, they have all the network and association uh, to kind of take advantage of the economy. So there are this power, uh, power hierarchies uh, ongoing. And a lot of people didn't like it. Workers didn't like to be ordered around by the managers. And the peasants in the communes didn't like their production team leaders to you know, take advantage of them, right? Well, they didn't do any work. And that is why I think there's always this kind of uh, counter movement uh, supported by the pro-socialist faction, trying to kind of mitigate this kind of uh, hierarchical structure by launching cultural revolution, by launching this kind of um, industrial management reform. Um, but it's very difficult uh, to actually sustain the results because again, it was a poor country and there were not many people who actually has the knowledge and expert to become effective leadership. Um, there was one uh, book written um, uh, about uh, communes, uh, Chinese communes and its uh, decollectivization process. And one of the example that was given, I think it was really an interesting case, was that there was a commune leader who, you know, every commune members know that he has, uh, he, he always sexually assaulted women in the commune. And at one point he, you know, basically made some arrangement and he even raped the women. And then, you know, uh, he was arrested. He was arrested uh, for, for several days, for, for several uh, weeks. And then the commune members had to retrieve him back because there was no other person who can perform that leadership role in the commune. And that person, although he isn't, you know, just a, an evil person, but he's the only one in the village that can lead production effectively. And so, you know, this is really a very sad tragedy case to think about just because there are no, as Stephen Andrew, uh, Stephen uh, Anders was talking about, there was no red and expert 
not enough red and expert at the same time. There are people who are red, but who doesn't know how to manage the economy. But there are people who are expert, but they didn't, you know, they, they don't have the social consciousness. And so you have to make concessions to all these kind of people who monopolize knowledge. I think that's why during the socialist time, the states uh, did, made so much effort to try to provide education to people coming from working class background and peasantry uh, background with the hope that those people are more politically radical so that even if they are educated, they would still, you know, be relatively, um, how to say, you know, having, still maintaining those kind of social consciousness, you know, rather than abusing their power uh, in a way. So, I think those are all the problems and a working class and peasants have uh, are holding grudges toward this kind of unfair phenomenon. Um, and then uh, when the state trying to reform uh, was trying to decollectivize communes, for example, I know a lot of people are saying, or we're thinking that, okay, probably, you know, then we, we, we don't have to be ruled by that, you know, one commune leader anymore, right? Uh, or when, uh, uh, when the uh, state is trying to launch kind of capitalist reform in the urban sector. Um, I would say in the urban sector, the workers actually did strike back because they were very much used to this uh, idea of iron and rice ball, this idea of, you know, having lifetime job security. But for the urban workers, they really just lost power because now they are facing direct uh, competition from the rural sector. So rural sector was really the entry point for the state to launch all, uh, you know, this series of economic reform. Um, and so I, I think my answer uh, would, for the passiveness uh, among the peasantry class uh, with regard to the decollectivization policy was that they or I think I would say they were disappointed about the problem within socialism, but they also didn't have a clear idea of how to reform. And this is the same thing I think within Soviet Union when Yeltsin was promising reform is going to bring in more democracy, right? More kind of uh, fairness so that, you know, we, we will no longer have the Soviet elites having their special stores to, you know, uh, that they can go to and get their luxury imported goods. Uh, we are, we're all going to be equal. We can just buy, you know, buy, uh, buy things equally with our money. But they didn't, they wouldn't anticipate that there would be inflation crisis that you know workers will lost their pension overnight. That now the stores do have goods, but they just don't have the money to buy it, right? So you know, I, I think there was also this kind of experience thing. Um, you mentioned that uh, how can we really provide a Marxist explanation? I think again, uh, being determines consciousness, and you know we have to think about the material conditions that shaped workers or peasants uh, ideology or their, their mindset. For workers and the peasants, for peasants specifically in China, they never experienced capitalism before. They didn't understand, they didn't know what the, what the you know, uh, consequences of capitalism is, right? Uh, workers too. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, when Mao was saying, you know, each worker or peasant, you need to be very cautious about the capitalist rotors. He meant that you know, there are people within the party who are trying to launch capitalist reform. This would mean inequality. This would mean you guys are going to lose their, your job. But they didn't understand at that time. A lot of workers that I talked to uh, were telling me that, okay, we, we also heard about all those kind of statements during the Cultural Revolution, but we were just looking at our managers. And I mean, some of them are really nice people, are nice guys. I don't want to struggle against him. I mean, he's not doing anything bad. Um, it was only after the privatization, after layoffs, and they started to understand, oh, that's what you were talking about. Now this is capitalism, right? So I think the, the lack of experience, lack of real, uh, experience, real life experience uh, in capitalism also kind of um, constrained their um, imagination about what capitalist reform could be. And that also partly contributed to their observed passiveness uh, uh, you know, uh, against this kind of reform. Okay, Ying, so uh, uh, we're gonna follow some of different procedures than usual. 
because uh, it's 15 more minutes left. Yes, so what I will ask, about students. Still, let's have about three or so people raising points. Uh, um, so I took a course uh, as an undergraduate, very interesting course on revolutionary Chinese literature, which was about the pre-Mao period, which was a pre-communist uh, period. And it was uh, the, the main person, the king, as I would say of, of, of those authors, was a, a gentleman called Lucian. And so there was, so I wonder to what extent, you know, you, you've emphasized in contrast to Professor, or rather Andrew, uh, continuity rather than rupture. So I'm wondering if you also see continuity in the intellectual impact of people like Lucian, the pre-communists uh, who, as I understood, were going against kind of the backwardness and ignorance of local Chinese culture. And my second question, if possible, I wonder what your thoughts are on the accusation about China as uh, placing countries like mine, Pakistan, into a debt trap uh, with uh, things like CPEC, uh, and the accusation being that it's intentionally set up so that they can kind of take over the assets. Uh, and so that's, what, that's the American perspective that's given to, to us uh, against the Chinese. So I'd be curious what your anal analytical viewpoint is as it, as Okay, so who was next? We're going to take about three or four people. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm just wondering, maybe this is a very big question, but I'm just wondering how do you uh, estimate the presidency of Xi Jinping? I mean, what do you think of the significance of the Xi Jinping's reform right now in China within the context that you mentioned? Because you mentioned that after 1949, China went through two stages, but as far as I know, according to some scholars' view, China is now entering into a new stage. So, I mean, do you think that Xi Jinping, his economic reform is trying to make China closer to a neoliberal state or what he tried to, what he tried to do is to solve the problems that produced in the second stage in the Deng Xiaoping's area. So I'm just wondering what's your evaluation of Xi Jinping's presidency, his reform? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question is about foreign capital. I understand that uh, American capital has been investing in, it has been allowed to invest more in China's economy recently. And uh, I'm very curious about the trade deal that, that has been kind of bounced around lately with um, the US and China allowing specifically foreign banks into uh, and foreign credit into uh, China. And I'm curious about how this will impact China's integration within the neoliberal uh, marketplace. Okay, well, that's 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 a lot already. That's so a lot of questions. A lot of questions, and they're all very different. You know, very it, different, it, and, and they're all going in very different directions. Okay, <laughs> please. So some questions really deserve a dissertation to answer, I think. So I probably won't be able to address it adequately uh, within the short limit of time. Um, so I'll, I'll try my best. So, so uh, you, uh, let me see, uh, Iman mentioned about Lu Xun and his intellectual impact. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, he is a, uh, really the one of the most famous writer uh, in the modern Chinese history and he never personally joined the Communist Party but uh, for, the, for those of you who, who, who know uh, about, about 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 the Chinese education system his articles was really the required reading so we have to <laughs> read his read his books his articles and memorize uh, all of them because of its revolutionary spirit so he remains to be an independent thinker, never affiliated with the party. But the Communist Party actually really liked his work because it was very critical of the pre-revolutionary stage. Um, it was very critical of the re ruling regime of the Nationalist Party. And it was considered to be uh, a good inspiring intellectual sources for, 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 for the Chinese people. But actually, uh, now that you're, and I actually never thought about this before, but now that you're mentioning this, I know that in recent years, I mean, uh, we have some Chinese students here probably can correct me if I'm wrong. In recent years, there start to be some campaign about uh, removing Lu Xun's texts from, from the mandatory readings, right? So think about this, right? It actually happened after the economic reform when, uh, when, you know, when the state didn't really like to encourage this kind of revolutionary spirit anymore in that sense. 
the foreign bank question and also she's reform actually can be combined. Um, so I, I'm not quite uh, uh, quite understanding the new stage you, you were you were talking about, but my uh, I mean my comment on <laughs> President Xi's uh, presidency. I mean I would say that uh, he's using a lot of, of the uh, narrative, a lot of the uh, kind of uh, taking advantage of a lot of the discourses that people are familiar with uh, from the socialist period. He was talking about, you know, we need to have a harmonious society. And he was talking, he was tackling corruptive behaviors. Those are all the things that, uh, you know, would probably remind people of the socialist time period. But on the other hand, the economic policy was clearly market oriented, right? The foreign bank was the very example you were, you, you were mentioning. The for, introducing foreign bank was really the one of the key thing the neoliberal economists, um, you know, the uh, tr um, also the uh, mainstream economists has been arguing for for a long time. China should liberalize its banking industry. China should liberalize its financial market. Uh, so it's consistent. It's really consistent with uh, with the past thirty years of reform, which is more privatization, uh, more thorough neoliberal reform. So in that sense, um, I don't think uh, Xi himself is uh, making any efforts in in terms of reversing that kind of neoliberal trend at all. Um, someone mentioned about that trap. Um, on Pakistan, I mean, I, I mean, I am first of all, I'm not an expert uh, on this, but but I think, uh, of course, any country that uh, you know uh, rely on debt uh, would be vulnerable to the loan con uh, loan conditions, right? This we have seen during the structural. Uh, uh, kind of structural adjustment program that IMF and the World Bank uh, implement in African countries, for example, right? Uh, and in Latin America as well. So I think this kind of uh, critique is valid. And Ch China, as I said, is uh, now, mm, I mean, having, at least having a capitalist economic base. So a lot of the activities China was doing is very much consistent with the logical logic of capitalism, right? It has to expand market, right? It has to uh, resort to places where profit rate is higher. Um, itself, China itself, uh, using the Wallace Danian framework, right? Itself probably is not the core country, uh, core countries yet. It's also not a periphery country. It's kind of semi-periphery uh, in a sense, uh, meaning that they themselves, uh, Chinese people themselves, Chinese working class are ex being exploited, but at the same time, Chinese ex cap Chinese capitalists are exploiting people um, you know, domestically and abroad. Um, so all those kind of policies, you know, uh, one belt, one road initiative are just no, no surprising for, for a capitalist country, right? It's just a, basically trying to expand market to realize profit in that sense. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions, right? Yeah, if I, I could just finish with one, uh, you know, we read uh, uh, in the other class, actually, we just reread uh, Lenin on imperialism. I don't know, you must have read this text sometime in life. And, uh, and he explains that the surplus of the top core capitalist countries can only be dealt with through imperialism because uh, uh, you cannot spend the surplus in terms of raising domestic consumption, in other words, creating a welfare state, because you will no longer be a capitalist country. Do you share that assumption of Lenin back then? In other words, is China, you just mentioned that, of course, they have to go to places where the profitability is higher, and so they will be imperialist themselves. But uh, as the Wallerstein analysis already has it, the world is, doesn't have too many places left uh, for that. So would China be able to uh, violate this Leninist uh, assumption and turn to, uh, 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 to uh, domestic consumption and building a welfare state? Uh, or is that, is that, this, is that uh, excluded as a possibility in the next 20 years? Um. 
yeah, this is the question I didn't get a chance to answer. I think right. it's really, that's why I insisted on it. Yeah, that's a very important question. I, I myself wrote a paper about this. I briefly mentioned it in the slides, which is the short-lived golden age of labor activism, if you guys still remember, right? So uh, basically, I think, again, we have to uh, resort to the material base of a welfare state. Uh, from history, we can see that welfare state is only able to be implemented in a relatively in rich countries, basically, right? To put it bland, put it just uh, sim uh, simply, right? It, the country will ha need to have economic surplus so that they can make concessions. The capitalists can make concessions with the working class, but that's not a necessary. That's not a necessary and a sufficient. Uh, condition. Having economic surplus itself is just a necessary condition. We still have to have working class struggles. Yeah, to, absolutely. I completely yeah, agree. agree. That's how it happens everywhere. Exactly. Right? That's how it happens. Yeah. And in fact, even welfare state has variety, and the more, the more democratic variety is realized only where there's a very strong working class exactly. party and unions. Exactly. So you're going to need unions in China. You're gonna need yeah, union. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I agree. There are a lot of uh, actives trying to uh, help workers to establish independent unions, right? But in China, I think the particular uh, the, the peculiarity of, of the Chinese case is that it had a socialist history. So for a lot of the workers who had experiences working under socialist enterprises, they would demand more. They would feel that union itself is only a middle way because they already enjoyed more radical option than having an independent union. They enjoyed lifetime job security, for example, right? Uh, th those, are the, those were the institutional memories of a lot of the uh, elder workers. So in that sense, I think, uh, I think in early 2000, there was a very famous strike uh, launched in an uh, automobile uh, uh, enterprise factory, I think. It was led by an 85-year-old worker. Uh, it was successfully organized and the demand was anti-privatization. So they actually make more political demand rather than just unionist, rather than right, just right, economic right. demand. So I think that's really something special with the, with the China case. Well, that's really interesting. You're really <laughs> grateful, Ying, and it was really good. And you're answering questions too, very generous, and, and we appreciate it. I hope your department appreciates you just as much as we do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much.